Warmest greetings to all in the very blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now let us all turn to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now we continue. Last week, we learned what a true calling is. That is very important for believers to understand a true calling. Someone who is truly called and truly called to a particular church to serve full-time is what makes the difference. How do you identify someone who is truly called? Very often, the church has a lot of problems because they do not know how to identify. Now, not only that being important, God called Samuel. Now, now God is going to test Samuel because God is going to establish Samuel as the prophet for Israel. He is going to remove Eli and sons. We read that. And he will raise a prophet to lead his people in Israel. But Samuel needs to be tested. And his testing will reveal to us today how do we know someone is a true prophet of God? What are the criteria, characteristics What's the hallmark of a true prophet? And it's important for us to understand. So church, please do not come and say, oh, it's going to be, well, last week true calling, then two, three, true prophet. None of it concerns me. I thought we are going to hear things about how God will bless me, how God will help me. Now, a true prophet is crucial for the believer's life. Israel has not been having the revelation of God's word. If you look at chapter 3, verse 1, all right, the word of the Lord was precious in those days and, was, and there was no open vision. Now, what is this about? Is God unwilling to give his word to his people? No. The whole problem was this. Eli and sons, who were supposed to be priests, they were supposed to handle God's word and to teach God's word to the people. But they were not faithful priests. They would not, even if given the word, they would not teach it faithfully. It is not that God was not willing to give the people his word, but there were no faithful people. So God would raise Samuel for that task. But would Samuel pass that test? Because if Samuel fails, then again Israel will have no one to teach them God's word. And you read over here, The lives of the Israelites were miserable, especially for those who want to obey God, who want to know God, who want to love God, who want to get right with God. They did not have faithful priests to help them to do so. So when there are no faithful priests, no faithful prophets, you suffer. The people of God will suffer. The lives will be continuing in sin, for they do not even know what is sin or what is not sin. The church will be in chaos. One of the things that God warned in the end times, there will be abundance of false teachers, false prophets. God's word is very specific. The church will be in danger of that. How do you recognize? Is this a true prophet? When when wicked men creep in unawares, we studied in BBK this morning, the church will be destroyed. Your life will be destroyed. Your children's life will be destroyed. It may have a semblance of a church, but there's no truth in it. So it is important that you be able to understand. And also, if you are in a church, I've spoken about that. How do you identify? How do you know the church is a true prophet? If you're looking for a church, what do you look for? The true prophet is one that will feed you, that will guide you in the right way through the word of God, not his own ideas. It's very crucial. If you are seeking a church, this is the most important thing to be able to discern. Is there a true prophet in the church? Now then the question is this. First and foremost, before we even talk about what is a true prophet, we must know what a prophet is. What is a prophet? What is a prophet? Now the prophet has two key roles in the Bible. All right? Now the first one which we are which we most commonly associate with the prophet, is this. He prophesies, means he foretells. 
He foretells the future. So God reveals the future to him, and he tells the people, that is why we often use the word prophecies, what will come true in the future. So that is one of the key roles, foretelling, foretelling. Now, for example, here, you will see that God will tell Samuel what is going to happen to Eli's house. Look at chapter 3, verse 12. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. Now, God is going to tell Eli, uh, tell Samuel what he's going to do in the future. So that's one of the things, and, then Eli, and then Samuel is supposed to then tell Eli. And God even say, the whole Israel will hear. Look at verse 11. I will do a thing in Israel at which both years of everyone that heareth shall tingle. The whole Israel will know because this will come true. What will happen to Eli's house will come true. Tingle means they will be surprised, they will be shocked. But it will come true. Prophecies. Prophecies. Now, until now, Samuel has not received this kind of revelation. Revelation. Now, that is why I look at chapter 3, verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. What is this saying? Samuel, is God saying Samuel was not saved, did not know the Lord. Samuel is not saved. No. Because if you look at chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 26, and the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Samuel was serving God and he was in favor with God. Samuel was a saved person, otherwise there is no favor in God. So Samuel was a safe person. So what is this? They have, have not, verse 7, have, did not know the Lord. Based on verse 1, the context will tell us. He did not know means he has not experienced, personally experienced, intimately know the, that experience of God speaking to him and revealing to him things directly like he would to a prophet. Samuel has not experienced that. He has not known that personally. And then neither was the word of God yet revealed to him, meaning to say what? Not that Israel did not have the written word. They already had Moses' writings and so on. Not revealed to him. Means God has not, for a long time, given the word by revelation directly in person to a prophet, revealed the word to him that way. Samuel has not known that as well. It was so totally unknown to Samuel. Because by the time he was born, the word of the Lord was already scarce. So this whole concept of God speaking to someone directly, revealing the word to him directly, is something outside Samuel's experience. So that is what it means. The foretelling, he will, he will be told. So that is the first thing. Now is that so today? Do you go to a church looking for well, pastors that foretell? All right, this is what's going to happen tomorrow, next year, and so on in Perth, in your life, in your family's life. Now, this role of foretelling is no longer present because God says in the book of Revelations, you shall not add to my words or, or subtract to my words. You will not add or remove anything because the Bible is complete. Anything that you need to know about the future is, in, is between the two covers of the Bible. Whatever you God intends for you to know is there already. It is closed. No more new revelations. Please know that. So this part is over, the foretelling part. Now, in a sense, do I foretell? Yes. I, when I teach eschatology, what will happen in the end times? All right? What will happen next? What are the signs that you will see? Jesus Christ come back, coming back. And when Jesus Christ returns, what will happen? What will happen in the millennium, 1,000 years, when Christ rules on earth? What will happen after the 1,000 years? I teach you all that. My own ideas? No, I foretell. I foretell based on what the Bible has already told us. All right? So in that sense, there is that foretelling, but always in the Word of God. You cannot today look for pastors that have dreams and visions. Now today, we actually have Bible colleges, colleges set up to teach people how to have dreams and visions, how to receive new revelations from God. And those pastors that have that, they are very popular. People love to go there because it's very mystical. People are not interested in the Bible. Boring. We want to hear exciting things that will scratch our itchy ears. That is over, my friends, so do not look for that. All right? It's very popular today. We even have 
students attending Christian schools being told, you mean you don't have dreams and visions? Christian teachers tell them that. You need to ask God for dreams and visions. So God will tell you your future. Everything that we need to know is here. We are guided by this. Everything that God doesn't want you to know, whatever dreams and visions, especially those that contradict the Word of God, you reject. There are no more these regular dreams and visions. God has given the Word, it's over. Now then it's the second part then. Do we still need prophets? Now the second part, besides foretelling, which is over for us today in the New Testament church, is forth telling. What is forth telling? Telling forth means speaking directly, speaking what God says, what God has said. You just tell it forth, right? Without fear, just say it. Forth telling, like the prophets of old, God gave them the word. Now, um, Samuel also has, at this point of time, they have the written word, not complete yet. So he was also to use the word to to preach against sin, to condemn the people for their sin. Use the word to tell the people how to obey God, how to love God. Use the word of God to tell people who God is. So that is the fourth telling part as well. That's why when you look at chapter 3, verse 21, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. Now, yes, God did appear and speak directly. Then he also says, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. All right, so the word and his personal revelation existed then. So it was also the word. So Samuel would use existing word to foretell, foretell. This is what God says. Thus saith the Lord. And he's going to say some things that are already said by Moses. Nothing new. Foretelling. Now that is the part today in the church continues. The Bible, the word of God is given to us. The revelations are all here. The pastor must foretell the word of God without fear, all right? So that is the role of the prophet. Now then, God was going to establish Samuel as a prophet. He has called him, but it's not over yet. Samuel must be tested to see whether he will be a true prophet or not. And this chapter is a very good chapter, almost a classic chapter for the church, for individuals to learn. What does it mean to have a true prophet? What is a true prophet? What are the characteristics to assess whether this pastor is a true forth teller? All right? What's the hallmark? In other words, it's a classic chapter for that. So we must learn. And God God records it for us to be able to discern. Now to cover we can learn at least five characteristics from this this chapter. Just before Samuel would start his ministry very soon, all right, in time as a prophet, the beginning was a crucial test. Very often, that's the test for pastors. Right when you first enter into the ministry or just about to enter, God will test the man. Will he be a true prophet? Does he have the makeup of a true prophet? What is it? Can you recognize? Well, the first one, first one. Now look at verse 15. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Now we read, God told him, I am going to eliminate the line of Ithamar from which Eli came from. I'm going to eliminate it forever. So he's talking about not just Eli, the, chief, the high priest of Israel. And not only that, he's the, sub, the children of, of, of his that will take over him, they are going to be removed permanently. Now God says he will do something that the years, the, both the years of everyone that hear it will tingle. It will be shocking news. It will be unprecedented news. No more high priest for Israel. It's something that is unimaginable for a young person. I'm going to say something that will affect the whole Israel and the history of Israel's priestly line. And I'm going to say this to Eli. As a young person, 
it was a scary thing to hold that responsibility to do so. So he feared. The Bible says he feared. He feared. Now, one of the tests, and God knows the heart of men, the fear in the heart of men is natural, is there. And God has to test. When you fear, what would you do? What would you do? That's the test of the prophet. There is always some unwillingness in a person. Now, there are many topics that pastors do not like to preach about, does not like to deal with, because some of this will not be well received, not only by the society, but by the church people. There are some topics that will arouse unhappiness. There will be some topics that will offend congregation members because they are living exactly in that particular sin. There will be topics that people do not like to hear. There will be passages that sometimes just keeps repeating. Keeps repeating. Now, can you look at verse 13? God says to Samuel, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever. This is not a new message to Eli. It's been said before. It's easy for Samuel to say, God, you told him already, right? This is a terrible thing to say to someone. Maybe I don't need to tell him again, right? It's so unpleasant. It's so uncomfortable for me to say it. You've told him already. He can recognize it out of fear. Will he say it? God says, the prophet, you speak it. Now, the prophet is God's mouthpiece. Please understand it. The prophet is God's mouthpiece. God will speak to the prophet and say, you say exactly what I said. What is it? Mouthpiece. Now, what should a pastor do? It's in the passage, and it's again. He's covered this topic. People have been upset. If he's a true prophet, as long as in the passage, he will just preach it again. Samuel had fear. It doesn't mean that when the pastor is pre preaching those topics, he, he loves to say it. He may have unwillingness as well. But the test is, will he just say what is in the passage? That is number one. Right? Maybe some of you say, ah, I'm sick of hearing of this already. Sometimes I myself really do not want to preach it. But I must remind myself, even I'm unwilling, even there's fear, I must speak what God has given me to speak. Number two, what we learn, look at verse, verse 13 again. All right? Now he says, tell him this, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Go and tell him this. Right? He's you, as a father, you fail. Your sons are terrible sons. They abuse the sacrifices. You tell him that as a father, you did not stop them. Pointing out sins is something that the prophet must do. It's very unpleasant. But he was given the task to point out the sin of the high priest. Not general doctrinal preaching. Now, it's easy to preach doctrines, all right? Just preach doctrines. It's even easy to, to correct false doctrines. A true prophet must do that. But it's different to have to deal with very specific sins. So not only there will be the unwillingness, the, the, the fear even at times, but when God says these are sins that are present in the congregation, you have to preach it. You have to say it. It would have been easier for Samuel to just say, you know the doctrines of a high priest, and then cover it, all right? Oh, the doctrines of a priest in sacrifices. This is what we should be doing, and leave it as that. No, it was very specific. What exactly is the sin? You did not restrain your children. Very specific. It's easy also to preach. What's wrong with certain movements, certain pastors who preach erroneous doctrines? It's easy. But the moment it is about someone that you know in the congregation, and the passage that God gives is exactly the very sin that they are living in and they refuse to repent. What is a true prophet? The one who will say exactly what needs to be said about that particular sin. Now, it's important for you to recognize what is a true prophet. Because sometimes people get very angry. Now, perhaps you are not a believer yet. 
And then you hear, why do Christians talk about judgment? Why do Christians talk, say, I'm a sinner? Why do Christians say that, that sinners go to hell and go to hell forever? These are terrible things to say. But please know that a true prophet from God is one who says what God says and what God wants you to know. It is love. Please know that. It is love. God wants you to know the living God, the true God. He is the one who knows the future. He's the one who's going to judge men. And he says, I do not want to send anyone to hell. Whether you believe that it will happen or not, it doesn't matter what you believe. It is true. And I want you to know ahead of time. That is why I'm sending prophets to you to tell you, you are a sinner. Whether you think you are or not, it does not matter. I am the judge. I'm a holy God. It's my standard. And God wants you to know that sin's judgment is eternity in hell. You know, you, when you go and see a doctor, what do you like? A doc, you have cancer, all right? It can be dealt with at that stage. What do you want the doctor to be? Uh, nothing, it's just a little um, itchy scratch, and that's all. Go home, the doctor knows it's cancer, but uh, I don't think you like that news, right? So take some of this Panadol and go home. You're fine, don't worry. Or do you want a doctor who will tell you the bad news as, as it is, so that you can deal with it early. What do you want? A religion that tells you nice things, will bless you, will, will give you money, will heal you of everything, or one that will tell you exactly what's going to happen, and then you have a chance now to get right with God. Ask God, God, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for my sin. Please save me. I do not want to be in hell forever. I want to be in heaven forever, glorifying you, worshipping you, serving you for the rest of eternity in your presence. I don't want to be in an eternal hell that is unimaginable. Well, what do you want? Well, same for the believers. You must be able to identify. If you're looking for a church, what are you looking for? Someone who will not deal with any specific sins. Preach generally, that is all. Don't talk about judgment. Don't talk about sins in your life. Well, God was very specific. The test was, will you say the very sin that I need you to point out? Will you say it? Now, many today um, stay on topics that are pleasing to the ears of people. Nothing, stay away from anything that will cause them to tingle. <gasps> what do you mean? What do you mean? God, God doesn't want me to live this way. Stay away from that. Don't talk about that. Stay away from anything that will displease the trends in society. Stay away from topics that will expose the carnal, worldly lifestyle of Christians today. There's keep on popular theology. That's all. What people love to hear. God wants to bless you. God wants you to have, have pleasure. And that's it. So that is the test of a true prophet. The second test, all right? So first one, even he's unwilling, even there is fear, he will say what God says. And if that thing is about pointing out sins, he will not refrain. So don't look at the church. These pastors uh, in these particular churches talk about this sin, that sin. So, so untactful, right? Without tact. Now, I'm not saying that pastors should be um, rude, unloving. We say it out of love. God wants you know, to know your sins means God loves you. The next one, the third one, he's no respecter of persons. He is no respecter of persons. Easy to point out sins of people you don't know. But when you have to point out of sins of person that is very close to you, would you, as a pastor, say what needs to be said? Now, Eli, think of this. Eli was Samuel's spiritual mentor. How he needs to serve God and everything taught by Eli. Serve together with Eli. So people who are your spiritual mentor, people who, are, who serve together with you, if God exposes the sin, you must still say it as God says it, right? Don't be blind followers of men. You know, this person is the, my spiritual mentor. You know, I got saved, and this person it was one who led me to Christ, and then I, I got to support him. Understand what is, what is a true prophet. 
no respecter of persons. Now, another one in, under no respecter of persons, think about this. Eli, Samuel was indebted to Eli. He was practically family, his foster father. You know, Wien, the moment he was weaned from the mother, already sent to Eli. And Eli brought him up. Practically family, foster father. What would you do? What would, should a pastor do? Someone helped him when no one else did. Practical like family to him. Dependent upon this person. Right? Benefactor. What would he do when the person goes rogue? Spiritually. Unbiblical. Whether in faith or practice. What is a true prophet? He will still say what God wants him to say. Now, I know some of you are aware that the BP movement went through a split. Well, went through several split. Because of doctrinal disagreements, even the very co-founder of the BP movement, when he chose doctrinal errors, the other founder, Reverend Timothy Toll, have to say, then we have to part ways. They founded the movement um, together. They served together. They were each other's um, spiritual encouragement, maybe mentor in one way or another. But what is a true prophet? Now, just close one eye. Close friends. Uh, when I was standing alone, you supported me. What would a true pastor do? When you hear such thing, what are you going to say? What is this Reverend Timothy told? Because of him, you know, we now have diff split churches. Or are you going to say, that is a true prophet? Always upholding, abiding by the truth. Even if it is his closest spiritual friend or even family members. You see, the problem is the other co-founder. My children, they chose these erroneous doctrines. So I have to stick with them. Who is the true prophet? So be able to identify and don't get angry when sometimes this kind of split happens. All right? There are those who blame, blame. If not for all this, there is no split. What is the use of unity when there's no truth? That is the role of the prophet to ensure the truth continues. Now, what else about, about re no respecter of person? What do you expect? Pastor, I was nice to you, you know. Um, I gave you things, you know. I cooked for you, you know. And then now you point out my sins. And then now you say these kind of things. How do you think? What do you want the pastor to be? Some may say, well, you know the church pay your salary. So you say what we want you to say. You preach what we want you to preach. You don't preach the things that we tell you not to preach. Then you do not want a true prophet. Right? You want a hireling. The, the Lord say hireling. You want someone who would, who would take salary and do what you ask because, because of salary. Hireling. Now then, the next one. All right? Well, well, there are also, before, we, before I move, respecter of persons, rich people. Now, if you ever discern a pastor, very nice to the rich, ignores the poor, look down on the less educated. Wow, very nice to the highly educated and the professionals. Watch such people because they are respecter of persons. They will say things that will please their close friends, rich people that maybe pay for their children's education, they're indebted to them, and they will change their doctrines. At first against this, then the, 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 this rich person or this person is indebted to commit a certain sin or living in certain sin, then he changes his, his tune to suit the other person. Well, Samuel was supposed to be spokesman of God mouthpiece of God. That is a prophet. Whoever it is. So not only there is fear, he must speak. Not only he must speak specifically when God tells him specific things. He must be willing to say to specific people even if, if it means friendships, even if it means he may lose financial, physical support. That's a true prophet. Now this is very often how we support missionaries in the field. 
We watch them for a long time. We need to see them go through Samuel's test. What would they do when they lose all the financial support from unsound churches? Will they still preach the truth that the Bible has no errors? Will they still stay firm? That, then we know this is a true prophet if he does so. He will separate from them even if he means he has no money, no salary, don't know how to support his family. These are the true prophets we support. We watch. We watch them go through the test. All right? Now, that is why we take time. Don't keep asking, why, why, why we're not supporting this, supporting, why we're not supporting all this, this, this. We are watching. There are many that we've been told to support. After some years, they, they capitulate. Some leave the ministry, it's not even truly called. Some now are in uns uh, serving in, in unsound churches for the sake of money. We waste God's money, all right? So, no, a true prophet. Now, then the, then the next one, the fourth thing. The fourth thing. He speaks the whole counsel of God. He speaks the whole counsel of God. This is an important hallmark. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. Every wit and hid nothing. Everything that God gave as a counsel, he spoke. Nothing did he ever withhold. This is an important hallmark, right? The, in fact, I would say the goal of platinum certifying standard of a true prophet. Whether it's good news or bad news, whether it's what people like to hear or do not like to hear, not only he would he would not be respecter of person. He will be no respecter of doctrines as well. If God says that this doctrine is true, even if other Christians say, well, or, or, or society feel, this lifestyle is not sinful. But if it is in the Bible, it is sinful, he will just simply say, this is what God says. He won't avoid those topics. The whole council tell you both, you like to hear, and those things that as Christians, well, today many Christians, well, they support certain lifestyles, certain um, beliefs um, that are unbiblical, clearly unbiblical. Will the pastor also teach what God says? The whole council, the whole council, every week, everything that God says. This was the key test um, for, for Samuel. And God wants us to know Basically, it's this. The pastor cannot add or subtract. Never add or subtract anything from God's word. That's a true hallmark. Samuel, God needed to know if Samuel had the makeup to be a true prophet before he sent in help for the whole Israel. Now, look at verse 18. God records this for us to know. Every whit and hid nothing. So in his fear, in his looking at this is my benefactor, what will happen to me if I say this? Will he get angry at me and kick me out of the temple? Then I cannot serve God anymore. Aha! Will you feel that in order for me to continue serving God, I will compromise? There are some who threaten pastors. And that's where you must learn what is a true prophet. The church don't like this doctrine. And this doctrine has divided churches. For example, verbal plenary preservation. All right? So some, some threaten. I know of my classmates. I know of an individual personally. If you do not stop preaching, the part that we don't like, which is the Bible has no errors and the words of God are all known and nothing is lost. If you don't stop preaching that, we will not renew your contract. Happened to my classmates. All right? But if you stop, all right, this part just don't preach. We don't like it. It divides churches. That council, that part, if you don't, you can continue. We will continue to support you financially. So many go through that in a ministry. Will the person continue to preach the whole council? That is the question. Right? That is the measure of a true prophet. Now then the final one, all right? The final one. Well, actually, staying on this, all right? The whole counsel of God. Now, why is it important? Why is this, before we move to the fifth one, why is this so important that the 
prophet foretell everything in the scriptures and don't avoid any. Number one, because the reason why God sends prophets is to help people know what is wrong. What you cannot and should stop, cannot do and should stop doing in order to prevent you from reaching the stage of Eli and sons. That is the reason. And if a prophet avoids that, it's no good for you. In other words, it is important for a prophet to preach the whole counsel of God to you, even if it's something that you're living in and you don't like to hear, it's for your good. Before you, as an individual, before your family is destroyed, like Eli's. God has told you many times. So, if, so the point is, even if you don't like to hear, it is for your good so that you will start to change. Number two, why is it important to preach the whole counsel of God? Because there are those who want to hear. There are those who want to obey. There are those who are willing to obey. They need to hear. So sometimes I'm unwilling. So oh, this topic again, but it's in the passage. I know some people feel, oh, Pastor, we know that already. But it's in the passage. But I have to remember, there are new people. There are people who, in their hearts, may be struggling still. And they need to hear again. You may not want to hear. Then you want to choose to be Eli and sons. It's up to you. But there are those who need to hear, who want to hear. You know, last night, Friday night, I was speaking to a student who came to join us from the University Outreach. And she said, I learned something tonight that I never knew were sins. I need to go back and think about this now. And she said this, you know, I'm afraid there are many sins in my life that I'm not aware of. And I'm still living in those sins because I don't know about them. What should I do? Now, you see, there are people out there who really want to know. Well, of course, the test is this. The test of a true prophet, he will preach the whole counsel of God to you. How would you respond? That's a message for another time, next week. So now, there are people who need to hear, there are people who want to hear. People leave churches to join churches where it will, they will be taught. So the whole counsel of God must be taught. Otherwise, the prophet fails miserably. Fails miserably. Samuel needs to pass this test because, God, because Eli and sons would not do that. And God had to test Samuel in the beginning of his ministry. Will you, will you be one that will would tell every wit that I say to you and withhold nothing from anyone. You pass the test, you're ready to go out now to the whole Israel because the whole Israel needs to know. The entire Israel needs to hear. There are those that will reject you when you preach the whole council. It is true. There will, as we study the book of Samuel, you will see there will be those that reject Samuel, hated Samuel. There will be those. Same in the church today. When a pastor preaches the whole counsel of God, does not avoid any topic. As he comes, he preaches, he teaches. There will be those that leave the church. Right? When they leave the church, they will badmouth the prophet. They will want to go to churches that will not deal with these sins in their personal lives, in their family, because they do not want a true prophet. They want to be, choose to be Eli and sons. So we still have that today. You meet them on the streets, they will complain. They will murmur. They will say, you know, cover this, talk about that, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so we can learn at least um, these five things. These five things. Now, then the next question is this. Now, why is this important to the church? Why is it important to the church? Now, let us... Look at um, verse, verse 18. Verse 18. Now, first and foremost, God told him many things and hid nothing from Eli, uh, Samuel, and Samuel repeated everything. All right? But one of the things that you notice, all right, you notice, look at verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Ah, and the Lord was with him. Number one. A true prophet is important to the church. Covering at least those five characteristics proven in him, 
Because God will be with him. You want to go to a church where God is not with the pastor? Here, when the prophet lives as he should, passes the test and lives in those criteria, God will use him. God with him, what's the benefit? It means God will use him. It's not for his personal benefit. God will use him for your benefit. God will, raise, God will remove Eli. He will not leave his people without help. He will raise a faithful prophet. Samuel passed the test, and Samuel will be a great benefit and blessing to the people, to the church. So the first thing that we must realize why it is so important for us to discern and receive and accept. Now, look at how God puts it. Look at verse 20. And all Israel from then even to Bathsheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Prophet of the Lord, not prophet of Eli. They were very happy. But God says from then to Bathsheba, now this phrase is usually to say far and wide. That is what it means, all right? Far and wide, they, they knew. Meaning to say they, they, they discern. God does want you to discern. Understand, know in your heart. Of course, they knew, meaning to say they will also now begin to, we have a prophet. Finally, far and wide, this person is going to be helpful to us. God will use him. God is with him. We are so happy now. Now, why is it a blessing? Because the people will begin to know a few things. First and foremost, they will begin to know their sins. Well, I didn't know this was sin. All my life, me and my family, we've been doing that. So some families, they go to churches that are sound. They are very thankful. I never knew th this is how to live. I never knew this was wrong. We are going to change. And then they begin to grow spiritually. Singles as well. The blessing is you will begin to grow spiritually when you know what is sin and you repent. That is what the prophet, or rather why the prophet must preach the whole counsel of God. Number two, you will begin to know the Lord more and more because the word of God will be taught without reservation. Not to just to please you. Not to preach things that, well, the scholars in Bible college um, approve of. You know, sometimes it's increasingly shocking. I read about them, but it's increasingly um, shocking to me. Well, my ears tingle in that sense. When visitors come to our church and they say, well, I, you know, I went to um, this Bible college and then the preacher says, well, um, Genesis is a it's just a fable, all right? These are just stories. It's written to just to, you know, answer some questions. It is not real. And then the church leaders tell them, wow, this sounds strange. But they say, oh, never mind, it's okay. Just, just continue, continue, you know. These are professors, you know, professors of Bible college, respecter of persons. Well, you will not grow to know God as you ought to. So knowing God, what happens next? Your life, you will begin to love Him more. You will begin to love him more. You see, but the Bible tells us the people abhorred the sacrifices. So you imagine you're born in a time where you see this kind of rubbish in the temple. Some of the children, they begin to hate going to church. Why? Because the truth is not taught. When the truth is not taught, the truth is not obeyed. And there are all sorts of mess. I keep saying this. There are many of our worshippers. They say their family members say, I will never go to church. I would never believe in Christianity. Why? Why? Because there are pastors who molest people. There are pastors who commit adultery. There are pastors who, well, um, cheat money from the church, steal money from the church. Everything is covered up. Nothing is exposed. Nothing is dealt with. And they continue in their sin. But when there is a true prophet, there is true teaching, you know God. You say, now, now I know this is God. These people, the way they live, this has nothing to do with God. You begin to love him. Like I said, it's very sad. Like when I spoke to these students who came, one of them said, I find it difficult to trust God. I said, why? They say, because of things I experienced in church. If this is church, then I guess, you know, it's difficult to trust God. How sad it is. See, when true prophets are there, they will begin to know, this, now I know this is God. These people are the problem, not God. You begin to know God more and more about God and you will begin to love Him more and more. And you will begin to obey Him more and more. You see, the peop, you will begin to grow, in other words. 
That is the point. A true prophet helps. It's a blessing because God is with him and he will use these people, these prophets to help you to grow and the church to establish in his work. Now, another reason why it is, it is important for the church. Now, when you see this, look at verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel, again and to Samuel. I want you to take note of that. The Lord did not just appear once. Samuel has passed the test. It's very important to have a good prophet because after that, God will appear to him again and again and again and specifically to the prophet. So you say, Pastor, did God appear to you last night? No. Oh, bad prophet, go away. We already said, God does not work through dreams and vision anymore. Please look at the verse also in Shiloh, by the word of the Lord. Today is always by the word of the Lord, right? Now, what am I trying to say? Do you know why there is a benefit when you have a true prophet? Especially one who is truly called, called to the church and he, is, he, he ensures that he exhibits the true hallmark of a prophet because God will appear to him again. What does it mean? It means that God will tell the pastor who he calls to that church the need, your very needs the needs of the church, the needs of the congregation, the needs that are coming, he will appear and he will show him. And he will reveal him by the word. Now, when, when a pastor says, I don't know what to preach, I don't know what the people need, I have no clue. And when the pastor, because God says he will reveal himself by the word. And a pastor who sits there or a preacher or someone says he's called and then he opens the Bible and he just stares at it for days and says, uh, I, I don't know what to preach. God, God is not speaking to me. It's because I believe, number one, he's not called. Number two, he, he would not be a prophet. Why would not God reveal to Eli and sons anymore but to Samuel? Because Eli and sons have failed repeatedly. No point telling you what the people need. You are not going to teach it. But here, God says, I will keep using Samuel. I will be with him. I will let Samuel know what Israel's needs are and Samuel will speak it faithfully. So I want to repeat again. If a full-time worker, a preacher or pastor doesn't seem to know the need of the people, it's because God has not spoken to him. He just keeps wondering what to preach. What will he do next? Typically, he will just listen to someone else's sermon because he's blank. And when you begin to hear a preacher regurgitate someone else's messages, regurgitate what he learns in the FEBC, nothing new. It's always the same, same phrases, same ideas, same thought. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with repeating, right? We already said some things God said, I told you already. But there's, there seems to be no understanding of how the people need to understand this topic. Or just takes or copies his sermons from commentaries, dependent on commentaries. Meaning to say, he has no revelations from God. I'm not talking about visions. Huh? It's very dangerous. You will not grow because, you, do you understand why? Commentaries are written by people. Right? At that time, they have a certain burden for a certain situation. Some other pastor's message is, if he's a truly called prophet, God will speak to this pastor because this congregation needs that message. And if this preacher just simply takes that, this message was not meant for you. It's meant for another congregation. God says he will appear again to Samuel and he will give Samuel the very words to speak to Israel. Now you understand why it's important? Embrace, embrace a true, a true pastor, a true prophet. Don't get upset and say, I don't want to listen to all this. I want to leave church. Don't be foolish. God sends true prophets for you to grow in. Now then the next one. Why is it? Then therefore, what to do? In other words, now therefore, what to do? Therefore, what to do? Now before that, I want you to notice in um, verse, verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did, none, did let none of his words fall to the ground. 
did let none of his words fall to the ground. What does it mean? It means everything that Samuel said, they all came true. Not a single word was wasted. It means it did not come true. This was a test of the true prophet. Now, why, why was it so that everything that Samuel said came true? Why is it important to the church? Now, it means this. The reason why everything that Samuel said came true is very simple. Because he only said what God said. That is why it always comes true. No adding, no removal. Always comes true. Now, in other words, it is, in other words, it's important to have a true prophet because he will be someone that will handle the word of God very, very carefully, accurately. That is why everything that he teaches is true. It's true. He will, he will say it as according to the word of God. He will expose it from the word of God. He does not have his own agenda and try to read things into the passage and, uh, and say things to you. He can be trusted to handle the word of God and those things will be true to you. You will benefit from it. Appreciate, appreciate that. Now, last one. Lastly, and we close. Then how should we, how should we think? Having understood this, look at verse 19. Uh, sorry, verse 20. And all Israel from Dan even to Bathsheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Now the people understood it, they appreciated it, and now they notice it. Now when you reject, when you reject a true prophet, it is to your detriment. Why does God give true prophet? I mentioned it briefly already. Then what is your response? Then come. Come and learn the word of God. Because God gives a true prophet who knows your need and will tell you your need as you need to know it. Then come. Very often people don't want to come because they don't want to hear it. And that very night, that very message is for you or your family and you don't come. What is the point of Israel having a true prophet, know that it's a true prophet, and then it's going to ignore, ignore him? What's the point? So it's not only for us to know. It is for us then to, to then respond to the true prophet. God sent, then you go and listen and grow and receive. We'll see more of that next week, God willing. Well, in closing, I say, God speaks through the prophet. In other words, a faithful pastor. By the word of God today. The word of God, in closing, verse 21. By the word of the Lord. The word of God. The true prophet must understand this. The Bible stands high. The Bible stands true. The Bible stands tall. The Bible stands the test of time. Please know that. And any pastor... Any preacher that upholds the Bible for what it is, a prophet stands true if he upholds what the Bible stands for. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 246, uh, sorry, 256, 256, 256. Let us rise, 256.